He just has to. Dominguez is averaging nine points per game. Got 12 last game off the bench, as you see there. Keon Thompson with nine. Uh, he'll come off the bench. He'll play a lot of guard for Noah Fernandes, who they were without him for five games after he hurt his ankle at Harvard, then prepping for Rhode Island, coming off a ball screen, tweaked his ankle again. Coach Frank Martin telling us earlier today that it's it's going to be a pain tolerance issue. It's probably not going to be right here for a little bit longer, but he is out there uh, supporting his team on the bench here today, and he'll try to do as much as he can in street clothes. The tip goes to VCU. We're underway in Richmond. Um, and just throwing this out here, VCU starts slow. Coach Rose told us they started slow, not just once, not just twice, but an awful lot. So that's something to look forward to. UMass needs to get really going early to get them that cushion against VCU because VCU likes to play ahead. First shot from Jalen Deloach. Starting lineup for VCU. Deloach is out there with Ace Baldwin, the alpha dog, as Mike Rhodes said, of that team. Jaden Nunn, Nick Kern, Brandon Johns getting the start. Other side, UMass, Wildens Levesque, Brandon Martin, TJ Weeks, Matt Cross, and Rasul Diggins. Cross with it, 22 last game. Good look down low to Martin for the first bucket of the game. This is an issue with BCU. They lose cutters. They lose cutters. They play man. And this team, for some reason, is, is in my mind, a little disjointed. And they always lose cutters on the weak side. So look out for that. Mentioned already, Mike Rhodes telling us it, it's driving him crazy. The, the, the slow starts for this team. They've tried a couple tweaks. John's down low. That one too long. Putting Nick Kern in the starting lineup, which they've done again now. Third career start for him. Trying to get some of that energy. Deloach, nice denial. This could give him some energy on transition basketball. Off the foot of Martin will stay on this end. But just trying to figure out the recipe to get a little bit quicker start for Mike Rhodes, who's in his sixth season here for VCU. I don't know what the answer is. And I think we asked him, what's the answer? And I don't think he had an answer either. And that is extremely frustrating because VCU Havoc DNA is all about pressure. It's all about this idea of energy. But you have to be on point. If you're not precise, Havoc is chaos. Travel turnover going the other way. Yeah, he even said that they had a really good shoot around when they were at Loyola. And then he said it was another not great start. So even when they've had good shoot arounds, bad shoot arounds, good practices, bad practices, they haven't been able to solve that problem quite yet. Slow start offensively so far. Nice little floater in the lane. Four point lead early on for UMass. UMass is doing a great job of taking advantage, like I said, of this slow start. VCU tried to change the momentum. Basketball is all about rhythms. And what at the very beginning there, they weren't going, and nothing was going good. A, a classic just faux pas on their instance. So then what they did was full court press. You'll see that from VCU trying to change the rhythms up. John's taking Martin off the dribble. Getting Martin on the foul. Here's the last two points for UMass. Cross, nice little touch on the floor. That's beautiful. That's, that's old school. It looked like he was in slow motion. Reminded me of George Gerber and that ice man. That was, that was smooth. Cross, so important to Frank Martin. He's trying to build that UMass was a player that he recruited out of high school. Thought he was going to get him at South Carolina. As Deloach gives UMass and VCU their first basket of the game. Quick move, and then, of course, here's the full-court press. Sometimes VCU will show a full-court press and then back off. And a foul on it. No, that's going the other way. Frank Martin wants an explanation. Yeah, you see you're moving. Yeah, you, you can't. You have to be set if you're going to do that. So Wildens Levesque picks up his first foul. Shuffling the feet ever so slightly. See that, and that's just you and I can talk about this in greater detail, but that's just a little sloppy. You gotta pick it up. You know, that's you're going to get the full court press, VCU. You gotta be on your P's and Q's. Shot blocked by Levette. Back to VCU. Throws down Nick Kern. There's that energy to start a game. Fantastic. Spectacular. <laughs> He knows it. He, he's soaking it in. That was incredible. First of all, Levesque, what a play. And then Kern to be able to dunk over the big men. I mean, that is all six, ten of them. Buried them in the rim. That could be a highlight for a long time. Nick Kern at 6'6", six, six, easily dunking over the six foot ten Wildens Levesque. Yeah, I feel like we have our first big-time highlight of the game. That might be the spark that VCU needs. Now, if I'm UMass... 
We got a whistle. T.J. Wheat's tied up. This is exactly what UMass needs to do. But, but first, you have to understand, right now, UMass needs to, to dictate the pace. That's a great veteran move by T.J. Weeks, drive to the basket. Because in these moments, if you're trying to reestablish rhythm and get them to play the tempo you want, go to the rim. Make them foul you. Slow the pace down and take back control. Weeks for three. Yes, nothing but net. That's something Frank Martin wants to see from the redshirt junior guard. He says, don't wait for things to happen. Go out there. Get out of your comfort zone a little bit. If you're too good a shooter, just have two or three shots per game. Good look by Johns there to Kern and the whistle and the foul down low. And this is what T.J. Weeks does. I mean, he's shooting basically a coin flip from the three-point line, which means, you know, in, in layman's terms, give him the ball if he's open <laughs> from the three-point line. And this is what we just talked about. Make them foul you, reset the tempo, run a set play, hit the open shot. Tempo's back in your in your court. Now it's interesting though, if you look how many fouls Levesque has, he's going to the bench. It's nine and four minutes, that's too quick. And this is one of BCU's Achilles heels. In addition to the slow starts, they lack an interior presence. And Levesque, I was looking forward to seeing how he would take advantage of that. The past couple games you've seen opposing teams go inside against VCU. He's already on the bench. Kern knocks them both down. Always off the made basket. Life a little more difficult for teams playing VCU. Got to get across the half court line. Diggins does. Martin cross court. Weeks thought about it. They'll reset. Watch for backdoor cuts. Looking for the perfect shot. Diggins off the mark. Cross bangs into Deloach. Rebound goes to Kern. Quickly the other way. John's down low. Nice move to the basket. Strong with it, but good denial by DeAndre Dominguez, who's in the game now for UMass. Great defense. Hold your ground. Arm straight up. Don't foul. Early one-point lead for the Minutemen. There's Weeks. That one off the mark from three land. It's UMass is starting to take bad shots. The last one, not the one that we just saw, the one before that contested. Now we're seeing BCU get better looks. A little too high for Deloach on that pass. A lot of intensity. Early minutes it here is in Richmond. Inside there. And they've had a lot to cheer about, especially offensively for this VCU offense here lately. You see their first 11 games, Corey, a little bit of a struggle, 66 points per game. Last seven games, they've got that rhythm going. That's a big part of David Shriver, who has not played in this game, getting his offense going, too. Yeah, like I said, he's nearly shooting 80% from him. I mean, that's like a B. I mean, you're, I mean, imagine getting like a B in organic chemistry or something like that. I mean, that's a very hard subject to do well in. And that three-point land, if you're talking about a good three-point shooter, 40% is amazing. Like, yeah, it's amazing. So to go 80% over the last couple games can just doubling like a Steph Curry type of average. I mean, that's wild. So he just checked into the game. This is an interesting moment. For me, he is the X factor for VCU. When they need to get going and get that cushion I, I explained earlier at the beginning of this game, he's the guy they go to. He knocks down those open shots, and then VCU can pressure, and basically UMass will have to They'll feel the pressure ratcheting up, and they're like, we have to score, we have to score. The more they force it, the more bad shots they take, the more the havoc. It's a, it's a, it's a virtuous cycle for VCU. See David Shriver, number 35, in the game for the first time for the Rams. Diggins got a whistle and a foul, driving to the basket. We'll go to the free throw line. I, I will say, though, with, with VCU, yeah, see, he was moving in. He was not set, and he leaned in. Can't do that. Uh, I will say this about BCU, though. They started off slow, like they do every game, but they, they really have found their rhythm as of late because I think they've found that identity. It's hard when you have so many transfers and new players coming in every single year, especially Brandon Johns Jr., who's supposed to be the man. Coach Rhodes told us, look, Ace Baldwin is our alpha, but we need Brandon Johns to take that role of being the guy. It's hard to do that uh, in a new program. So I think as we move forward, they're sitting at the top of the 18 standings, and they're only going to get better, which should shock the rest of the conference. They should be extremely nervous. Well, they got seven newcomers. Mike Rose trying to figure out 
how they all fit together. You got the transfers and Johns and Zeb Jackson both coming from Michigan. Shriver from Hartford. You got four freshmen out there as well. Jameer Watkins checks into the game. Down low to Johns. We got a whistle. I, I do like how active Brandon Johns is. He's not finishing around the rim. I understand that. But I do ha like how VCU's trying to get him a touch every time down the floor. That is just going back to this vote of confidence. Hey, I know that maybe you have never been the guy in college. Now we need you to be the guy. We're going to give you early touches, early and often. First foul on Isaac Conte for UMass, who has checked into the game. Baldwin thought about Shriver. Cross was really slow on that, on recovering to get Shriver the ball. I'm telling you, he's going to be open a few times. Good denial by UMass. Cross weeks Don't for leave him three open. short. Watkins skies for the board. That's a good shot. If I'm UMass, I am thrilled with that possession. Ace will reset it. So much goes through Ace Baldwin. Nice look down low to Jackson for two. He's a facilitator. And he does such a great job. That one-handed shelf pass, but breaking the press. Forgot about Weeks. Going to get a foul on Watkins. Let, let's take a look at this, this pass. A one-handed shove pass right through two or three guys, threading the needle. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. It was such an intense game last time out versus Dayton. They had to come back from 16 down, did it in the final minutes in a hostile environment. And I was talking to Coach Rhodes about it, and I said, I, I don't remember you taking out Ace Baldwin. It says here he played 39 minutes. I could have sworn he played all 40. Um, but there are some games where they just he just does not want to take him out, even for that one. When, when you have a leader with veteran experience who makes everyone else better, that's one thing about college basketball that's very important. You're not going to have a guy, you know, put up 50 points, right? Like, it's not like the NBA where a guy can kind of take over to that level. Your leading scorer has 12 points or 15 points. You have to be able to get everyone else better. And when your best player is a facilitator who does that, who hits David Schreider and gives him, Schreider, a chance to hit five threes in a game, gets Brandon Johns the looks around the basket, gets people like Mick Kern involved. That is, that's exactly what a college program needs. And that's why he doesn't leave the floor for more than 30 seconds a game. I will say TJ Weeks, though, is, is I, I think, being the X factor for UMass right now. His veteran leadership, his ability to hit open shots, and basically anything that UMass has done that has been good has come by number 23 as of yet. Tafara Gapari in the game for UMass. 6'9 freshman who they have very high, high hopes for. Misses his first shot. Baldwin, good work off the dribble. Loses it, but there's a whistle and a charge. Strong take, but look at that. Look at that convergence. One great awareness by DeAndre Dominguez to get in that position from the help and get the get the ball back. It looks like he was shaken up a little bit. Keeps holding his right hand, it looks like, or right arm. Yeah, so he will come out of the game. Sophomore guard Jaden Nunn comes in. But that convergence on Ace Baldwin. Ace Baldwin penetrated. You saw three maroon jerseys right there. What that means is one that's great, but that also means that there's two open guys. <laughs> so once Ace Baldwin realizes that and starts facilitating, that's going to be an issue for UMass. Dominguez, strong take. Are they going to count that? Count the, count the bucket. DeAndre Dominguez off the glass. That's a tough shot. Outside of the, the square on the, I mean, with that angle, you have to be a geometry PhD student to find that angle, man, or, or a great pool player, or both. <laughs> or, or both. Not everyone's as talented as you, Ahmed. Not everyone can be both. That foul, that foul was on uh, David Shriver. Didn't seem like a whole lot of contact on that play. Uh, the free throw is off. So UMass, uh, UMass not taking total advantage of their opportunities at the free throw line. It's a three-point game here, about seven minutes in. Jackson. Deloach. Working on Conte and gets it to go. This has been an interior game for the most part. 
I love how UMass continues to attack the interior of VCU. Keon Thompson into the game. We do have a whistle down low and another foul. Crowd doesn't like it. Take another look at it, Corey. What do we see here? Oh, no, I mean, that, that's a generous call, I would say. Looks like we got it on. It was either on none on the first or on Deloach. I think it came on none there. Yeah, none was the primary defender. It, it looked like he gave him a high five. Yeah. So, again, though, UMass having trouble at the charity stripe. You, you, this, this is one of the, the key elements here. If you're going against a team like VCU, you got to get to the line. The, the free throw line and you got to make you got to knock down these shots like these are just it's free money in a sense right three for seven in the game umass 43 percent from the line early on here do have a two-point lead shriver to deloach working on conte it's hard to post out from 18 feet and yet was able to spin around this is going to be an interesting matchup down low between Deloach and Conte. Deloach is a guy who Mike Rose said had a pretty good offseason. Dominguez, you can say the same thing about him. It's an easy two down low. And remember, Conte is 6'7". Levesque, who's on the bench with foul trouble, is 6'10". And Deloach has been kind of where they've been going through with the ball recently in recent possessions. A whistle and a foul on the defensive end for UMass. Take a look back at what we saw on the other end. See, David Schreiber steps up to get ball, and then there was a backdoor cut. And this is a tough, tough place. If you're a big man, you have to catch the ball 18 feet out, one-on-one, -on -one, pound, pound, dribble, spin. I mean, that, that's a tough possession. But at the moment, he has the size Deloche does. So I wouldn't – I think DC is probably going to keep going back to him. Now Dominguez is guarding Deloach. Coach Rhodes said that Deloach was in the gym There's before the weights mismatch. all offseason. 8 o'clock in the morning working on his game, and it's shown up here early on in this game. You see a high screen by Deloach roll down and get the mismatch on the undersized Conte, the 6-7 Conte. And he's there for the follow-up. They leave Dominguez open, and he'll take that three. <laughs> DeAndre Dominguez right now is playing on a Terry. Normally giving you seven, nine points or so off the bench. Most recent outing in that big win, he gave you 12. And again, coming up in a big way today. Hard drive by Jackson to Watkins. Open three. Trading triples. We're all tied up. About nine minutes into this one. Keon Thompson short. Watkins corrals the re rebound, and VC will push. Loose ball, no whistle until now, and we've got a kick. All tied up, a good one here at Richmond early on. Want to preview what's coming up this weekend on USA. Got two good ones for you. Top of the conference, Dayton at 4 and 1 at George Washington. That's at 12.30 Eastern time. Second game for a doubleheader in St. Louis. They'll host LaSalle. That's 2.30 Eastern all weekend long on USA A-10 basketball. Eight points for Deloche in this one so far. Some three-pointers made by VCU. Not one yet from David Triver in this game. He filled it up against Dayton last time out. Six of eight. That all came in the second half. All 18 points. They needed every single one of them, basically. And talking to Coach Mike Rhodes, he, he's fit right in to this program. His personality laid back from West Virginia. And he goes, he reminds me of someone. And I go, who does, he, who does he remind you of? He goes, you ever seen the movie Almost Famous? One of the main characters, Russell Hammond, played by the actor Billy Crudup. Do you see the resemblance there, Corey? A little bit. <laughs> I wonder if he can shoot three balls yeah. like, uh, like Shriver. I don't know that he can do what Brandon Johns just did there. His first bucket of the game, giving VCU the two-point lead. The interior has been very good to VCU. The paint has been very good. They're, they're up 14 points in the paint over six for UMass. And it's just Deloche Johns. Deloche Johns over and over again, it seems like. Matt Cross is going to have to step it up. 
Dominguez open again, nothing but net. He is <laughs> balling right now. I, I, he's perfect from the floor, minus that one error, that one little smudge on the free throw line. Good look down low. Athletic by the baskets, none. Ball's on the floor. It's like we're going to have a jump ball to stay on this end. Dominguez, 10 points, 4 for 4 from the field, Corey, like you mentioned. So Dominguez, one, he's feeling it. So give him the ball, every possession. And, and then the other side, Brandon Johns, Jr., this is what we're talking about. You're seeing these kind of like 18-foot-ish mid-range post-ups, which personally, you know, I don't like this too far out, but, you know, give him some time to, to face up, make a quick move, dunk it. That's basketball 101. Quick move, go to the floor, go to the rim and finish. That's a huge confidence booster. That's his first made basket of the game. So I'm thinking Brandon Johns wants to get more involved. He's calling for the ball right now. Let's see if he looks to score first. Looking aggressive again. Good look, though, on Kern slashing to the basket. VCU back on top. Two minute men came to help. Kern sees the, the, the backdoor cut, and Johns is able to facilitate. Dominguez with the ball. Out to cross. Off the side of the backboard. Lead to a little bit of a fast break. I think maybe Ace Baldwin had numbers there, decides to pull it back, set up the offense. None quick to the hoop. VCU looks decisive. And when VCU is decisive and precise, that's a, that's a, that's a problem for our opponents. Ball gets away from Diggins, and we've got another jump ball. Should stay on this end. Take another look at that last VCU hoop. Right in rhythm, not even a sliver of hesitation. Not even a moment's thought of, should I take it to the basket or not? You see the swim move, and he's gone. He finds an angle. Great, great, great move by Nunn. Nunn was part of the All-Atlantic 10 rookie team last season. Just the third freshman to start the season opener for the Rams. Started all games this year. Such a key piece to that team, that offense. Good look down low. Matt Cross, his first bucket of the game. A little backdoor screen for a backdoor cut. Second bucket for Cross after scoring 22 last time out. Deloach gets free. Whistle. And he'll go to the line. So offensively, a lot of things to like if you're UMass. But I know for Frank Martin, he builds his identity on, on defense. And he's not liking what he's seeing on that side of the floor. No. I, I think VCU is getting to the rim. I think VCU, although they are making at times, like I said, it's, it's a little more difficult than it needs to be. And this is a team that thrives from beyond the three-point line. So if you're UMass... Coach Martin's probably shaking in his boots, quivering a little bit, because you know they're a second-half team, and you know that once they get going from three-point three, three point land, it's over. It, that's, that's the good night part. So the fact that they're up by two right now, and they're not shooting very well from three-point, I, I mean, so I think that's probably concerning. Coach Martin sitting on 299 career collegiate wins told us earlier today that someone had to tell him that he was at that number. He's like, I've won a lot more high school games if you include those. And Keon Thompson trying to get number 300 for Coach Martin. Yes, he is extremely important for this team in terms of production. It's important that he gets going. Dominguez is already going. Matt Cross is the last one that needs to get going for UMass if they want to extend this lead. The Loach, good defense down low by Cross. Rebound goes to Dominguez. UMass a chance to add to their one-point lead. Almost turned it over. Cross able to get it back. Dominguez will try another triple. That one rims out. Deloach on the rebound. Ball gets free. Whistle. I think we got a foul. Might be on Cross. It is on Cross. But you have to, you have to, I mean, the hustle was there. Certainly. Seven fouls on UMass already in this game, so we're in the bonus with 8.21 to go in the first half, and Deloach will go back to the line. So in terms of game management, this is interesting going forward. <laughs> you, see, you see Coach Martin talking to Dominguez, and Dominguez completely zoned in the game, not even looking at Coach. 
I think he's kind of like feeling it right now. But it is it is interesting game management moving forward here. Knowing that you can't foul without sending them to the line in a close game. It's going to change the way that, that UMass plays. Right now, as soon as Deloche and Brandon Johns get the ball down low, you see two or three jerseys going and just mobbing them. You're going to have to, as a defender, you start thinking twice now. So Matt Cross brings it up with this game tied. Eight minutes to go first half. Thompson to Cross. Good look. Can't finish. That's a very good look, though. These backdoor cuts... And they're there. Kern, that shot was redirected by Martin. And now quickly the other way. Thompson again gets to the basket, but denied by Deloach. So VCU, we're all tied up here. And once again, it was a story line coming in. It has been a story in this game. 14 points off the bench already for UMass score. It's a misleading stat. Ten of those belong to Dominguez. <laughs> I think so. He came off the bench. He came, yes, he did. But this is what I'm saying. This UMass program is an interesting spot because they have so many new faces. I mean, and obviously leading with the head coach. And they are mostly getting it done by committee. And in the absence of Noah Fernandes, you have three guys, Matt Cross, Dominguez, and Keon Thompson doing that for you. So it is like an interesting like dynamic as far as who takes the, the, the lion's share of the load. And tonight's Dominguez. Cross trying to get involved, and that one goes. This is third basket. He's got a lot of really good looks. I like how they keep giving him the ball. He's trying to compensate, I think, for some of these missed baskets with hustle. And I like that. But once again, you have to realize you're in the bonus. So I like how he's, they're still going to him, though. Baldwin thought about it. We'll take a step inside the three-point line, and that one is short. Rebound by Martin. And Coach Frank Martin told us that this is why he plays a lot of players. He's not going to whittle down his rotation. He wants that depth. He goes, I recruited these players to play, and so that if we do have injuries, which they have had here recently, the players are ready. They've, they have played. Conte down low, hard take to the basket. What you didn't see before he got the ball was that deep seal. He, he was, I mean, maybe a foot away from the basket that's exactly what you want to do you deep seal the ball switches across and you're right there looking for the ball really good basketball by four point lead for umass ties their largest of the game step back three got it none that lead now down to one that's a tough tough shot that's only the second made three by vcu right now and you expect them to shoot i mean they're going to shoot much more <laughs> volumes more than three in the first half so you think Second half, it's going to rain, it's going to pour. Both teams shooting pretty well, both 52% from the floor in the game. That pass into the hands of Nick Kern got a turnover. And the Rams will set it up. None. Got to the hoop somehow. Whistle, no basket. In the cylinder, we're going the other way. One thing you'll notice, though, is sometimes... Some of these are, you know, going to the foul line, but you keep seeing Brandon Johns and Jalen Deloach around the basket. They're, they're both, it's a perfect picture. They're both standing underneath the net. This has been the storyline all game long. Coach Rhodes told us we need to be physical. We need to out-rebound UMass. That was the number one key to the game he told us. Out-rebound, out-rebound. And then the second one was limit turnovers. Right now they're doing that. And then a lot of these are offensive rebounds. Second chance points. I think... Mike Rhodes think they should have had a second chance point right there. It did look like the ball was off the rim. He didn't like it. Crowd didn't like it. Either way, nothing to show for that time down the court. And UMass retains that one point lead. Inside, good move. That is Gianni Thompson who has checked into the game here for UMass. About five minutes to go here in the first half. Sophomore transfer from Boston College. Shriver, the touch long, gets his own rebound, puts it on the floor. Might have been a mistake. It's Diggins with the steal. See if they push. Don't really have numbers. VCU does a good job getting back. Dominguez. Gapare, no. Rebound Thompson. Bodies on the floor. VCU does have numbers if they want to push. 
You see, it's, right now you see the pace has kind of slowed down a little bit. Driver open. <laughs> he doesn't miss from there. First made basket of the game for Shriver. Hustles to save it from out of bounds, too. Listen to this crowd. That person has three foam fingers. <laughs> it's like half a hand. This is an intense scenario. So, Shriver is, I talked to Coach Rhodes about this. It seems like whenever he makes a play, there's just electricity. The foul's going to go on Diggins. Take a look back at that. Three by David Schreiber, who Mike Rhodes hopes we see more of these. Brandon Johns, no look in between two UMass defenders collapsing. Hits a wide open Schreiber, is building on last outing where he was six for eight. But the, the thing is, I asked Coach Rhodes, I said, every time he makes a basket, especially a three pointer, it just seems as though the rest of the bench just gets a jolt of electricity. It seems like the whole team gets a jolt of electricity. In that instance, the entire arena jolt of electricity. That's why I think he's the X Factor. And Coach Rhodes completely agreed with me. He said he is just, yeah, electric for us. Our team loves him. And whenever he does well, the guys just love it. At the line for one and one here, Brandon Johns. Misses the first. Shriver, though, tips it to Kern, who saves it from going over the half court line. Back to back possessions where Shriver had that tip, the save out of bounds, and now this one to give it. BCU another chance. John spins, rolls out, tries to corral his own rebound, goes off of his foot. It'll be UMass ball. And while we're on Shriver, I mean, he's 16 for 20 from the three point line the last four games. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> You know, and 80% of his shots are threes. So uh, we have seen a two, that little floater down by the rim. That's very rare. File that away because you might not see another two-point attempt by Shriver. Dominguez had a couple threes in the game. Can't get that one in the paint to fall. It'll stay on this end, though, off of ECU. So here's Shriver. You know, we're talking Division Three for three years right there in his hometown. Division Two. Division Two, excuse me, Division Two. The story is good enough without me moving him down a division. Division two for three years by his hometown in West Virginia. Then went to Hartford, went to VCU, and Coach Rhodes said, yeah, he, we, we live and die offensively a lot with what David Shriver does. And he says, shoot, even when he was struggling early on in the year, he says, shoot, we need you to be the scoring threat. And he has the last few games. Diggins able to score and be a scoring threat, giving UMass a two-point lead. And the thing about David Driver, Coach Rhodes was saying, just perfect. He perfected the three-point shot. And I mean, that's a big compliment. You know, Coach Rhodes seen a lot of basketball. So that's, I mean, it's just the confidence that he has in Shriver. Like, like you said, early on, not really shooting that well. But now, continue to get better and better and better. The team shows that, too. Another foul on UMass. They do have the two-point lead. Two-point lead for UMass here. Three and a half to go until the halftime break. And that's good news because they're playing without their leader on the court. Their scoring leader leads in minutes, assists, three-point field goal percentage. Noah Fernandez got an ankle injury. He's missed some time already this year with it. Re-aggravated that injury. Prepping for the Rhode Island game. Talking to Coach Frank Martin earlier today, said that discomfort's not going away, at least not in the next couple of weeks. Just has to get to a place where he is at peace and can play and can still be mobile and do what he does. And certainly a big part, the biggest part of what UMass does. Uh, but it's got to be encouraging. They won against Rhode Island by 10 without him, and here they are up by two without him again. Very encouraging. If you're UMass, you're thinking, we have a deep team. You knew that because of the, the bench points, but now it's actually exhibiting itself. Obviously, is this sustainable? That's a different question. The answer is no. But it's at least a good thing that if your star player is out, you can still win games. Deloach making both. He's got a game high 12 points. I will say, though, it's interesting. We, we called that game when he hit that last second buzzer beater against Rutgers last year. He did. And there, he just hit a last-second buzzer beater against Murray State in close games, and UMass has had a few of them. You need Noah Fernandes out there. He's your go-to guy. I don't know who that guy is for UMass, 
in absence of him. Last time it was Matt Cross. This time it seems like it's Dominguez, but we don't know. Thompson's getting the minutes. And the freshman guard put up that shot just a little bit short. Baldwin out of bounds. So we got a turnover. 33 points so far for UMass. The most they have allowed in the first half this year is 37 versus Temple. So probably neither coach going to be completely happy with the defensive effort. They'll be happy with what they've done offensively in this game so far. Yeah, both teams hovering right around 50% from the floor all, all day long, all game long, which is very, very promising. Largest lead in this game for UMass was four points. For VCU, it's three. We've had eight ties. It's been very close throughout. But essentially, VCU has to be frustrated with, with backdoor cuts. A nice second chance there. TJ Weeks giving Dominguez the ball in a heroic effort. Dominguez working on Jackson. No. Deloach with another rebound. He's got seven now in the game. And then VCU has been taking advantage of all the offensive rebounds and, and points in the paint by their two big men. Jackson, good take to the basket. VCU back in front. Nunn had a really nice drive. Same scenario, coming off that screen, finishing strong at the at the at the uh, rim, and you see it over and over and over again on that right hand side by VCU. Guards getting to the basket. Dominguez keeping the ball moving. Cross, long, out of bounds, off Dominguez. VCU gets possession. In one of these inter instances where Matt Cross is coming off a career high game at 22 points, he has currently six points. He's shooting three for six. Some of these, you know, really good looks. There are elements of frustration. I need to force it. I need to do what my team needs me to do. Step into that role. I like what he's doing. Just keep shooting shots. It's going to fall eventually. Shoot or shoot. Trust yourself. Johns working on Brandon Martin down low. Transfer from Michigan with two. He's got four points now in the game. TJ Weeks is off the mark. And it's Watkins with the board for the Rams. No one picking him up. I think he thought about it for a second. Finds Jackson back to Watkins. He will shoot that three. Swish, nothing but net. Rams on a run. When they get going, they get going. Largest lead of the game for VCU. The crowd and the stew is on their feet. Students can party. A 40-point first half and growing for VCU. The seven-point lead. Nine-zero run for VCU. They have their largest lead, seven points. Final minute of the first half. This was the exact same part of the game against Dayton where they started clicking the final minute or two of the first half. And it bode well for the second half. This is, <laughs> UMass has to figure out some half halftime adjustments. Yeah, who takes that. that shot? Six to shoot. TJ Weeks is short, cross with the rebound. Kicks it back out to Thompson. That one way too long. Cross down low, up again, no. Weeks, no. Out of bounds, it will stay on this end. If Offensive rebounding is something UMass does very well. They'd like to make one of those. Though. Yes, they're very, very talented at offensive rebounding. And that's why this has been surprising that it's been, VCU has out-rebounded them. But in that instance, this is why offensive rebounding is so important for this team. Four chances. This is the fourth one we're, we're watching right now. In the final minute of the game. So UMass can take the last shot. Ten to go in the first half. Brandon Martin, no. Watkins has it. They can push here. Four. Zeb Jackson at the buzzer. No. But a good end of the first half by the home side. VCU goes into the halftime locker room up seven, Corey. I like what I see from both sides, actually. I like how VCU is basically true to form. They start a little slow, but they were able to keep it close with UMass, who, by the way, is really punching over their weight right now with that Noah Fernandes. Second game in a row. Got to love that aspect of it. But when it comes down to crunch time, 
Who's going to take up that there. shot? Who's taking part in the halftime warm-up layup line? That's nine points right there. I, I mean, this is kind of what we're, we're talking about, just math. Noah Fernandes gives you 14 points, just a shy of 14 points, generally per game. Luis gives you nine. Hey, this is a different ball game. Seen Dominguez pick up the slack for UMass and Cross. Team so, high 10 points for Dominguez. Yes, and Cross has six. I was a little hard on Cross just because I think coming back, I mean, coming off of that incredible game, you know, you think, okay, well, in the absence of Noah no Fernandes, you're going to have to give another 17, 15 point performance. You know, he's on track for double digits right now. There were times when it looked like he was just missing open shots or trying to force it. But to his credit, he's the second leading scorer for UMass. Seven point lead grows to nine early seconds here of the second half. Nick Kern. Just another astute cut. Dangerous time in the game, even though he just started the second half here for UMass. To me, this is like in football where you have, you know, you score before half on a two minute drill and then you come back and get the ball back and you score again. That's a 14 point swing. You have that 12 to 2 run by VCU to end the first half. If they go on another 8 0 run, that's, that's the same thing. Lost track of the shot clock. A violation. That's about the worst start to the second half that you could have if you were UMass and Frank Martin. That, yeah, that is not great. A, a easy bucket layup, and then you shot clock violation on the other end. Driving ace Baldwin dishes to Nick Kern misses there Baldwin with no points in the first half Team's leading score normally scores 12 a game Diggins no Wildens Levesque out of bounds off of VCU you see Levesque in the game was in foul trouble in the first half early early on He's only played five minutes in this game so far yet to put up a shot His presence has been missed sorely just the size, being 6'10". I mean, like I said, Brandon Johns Jr. and Jalen DeRoche have basically taken over for VCU since Levesque's been in foul trouble. Five to shoot again. We do have a whistle. Looks like they're going to get Brandon Johns for the foul on Brandon Martin. Johns disagrees slightly. Take another look. Brandon Martin, this is, this is right after, by the way, we saw Diggins take it hard to the rim. This is what you're supposed to do as a guard. Attack the basket, attack the basket, attack the basket. Worst case scenario, you go to the free throw line. <laughs> get two unguarded shots, right? Best case scenario, you get a layup. And I think in a best, best case scenario, if that's even possible, you get Deloche and Johns a foul. So that's exactly what happened in this scenario. Great job. The third and fourth points of the game for Brandon Martin and it's back to a seven point deficit for the Miniman. Baldwin to none. Deloach. That pass denied by Cross. Turnover. Diggins. Baldwin's going to get charged with a foul. Count the basket. This is exactly the issue right here. Too generous. Delos giving that ball up, trying to force the ball, trying to force the pass, and then Diggins on the other end doing exactly what we talked about. Attack, attack, attack the basket. They have to foul you. The issue for UMass, though, has been they've not been able to make any free throws, Ahmed. They were three for seven in the first half. Five for nine, although there. The free throw issues continue, at least for Diggins. Diggins coming off the season high seven points last game. Baldwin gets to the rim. He's finally in the box score, at least for points scored, his first two of the game. That one too high for Wildens Levesque, a turnover. Take a look back at Baldwin's first two of the game. Right there, that, that's a defensive breakdown. Levesque screaming at his teammates nearby. He slowed up thinking the help side would come. The help side never came. Never came. Coach Mike Rhodes saying about Ace Baldwin, he might be the most competitive kid I've been around. Dude just does not want to lose. Contributes in a lot of different ways. None. No. Oh, Kern. 
Tries with a emphatic foul. No. Able, though, to get back on the other end and alter that shot by Dominguez. Good hustle by Nick Kern. This is a couple times now. It's only been under three minutes, two and a half minutes. We're talking transition, transition, transition. What a putback that would have been. But we see TJ Weeks moving in transition. I thought Dominguez was going to give it up. I was surprised. He was looking down. Look up. Weeks is wide open under the, the rim. Weeks goes left hand back to Wilden's Levesque. Long range, too long. And Deloach with his ninth rebound of the game. He's close to a double double early moments of the second half. There's the repost by Deloach, right where they like it in the 18 foot. He saw Levesque. This is such a savvy move. Such a savvy move. So look. You, you've seen this a couple times. You know he likes to face up, make a quick move to the, to the basket. That's a combination of film study and experience. Mind you, he's only played five minutes, Levesque has today. Still knew that. And as soon as Levoch came in, was there to take the charge. Really, really, really great film study and preparation by Levesque there. Levesque knew Frank Martin from his days at South Carolina. Frank Martin said, we're going to try to build this program, put it on his shoulders. He knows how he likes to play. Physical, defensive style, doesn't give an inch, wasn't able to play a whole lot in the first half. Nice drive to the basket, no for Diggins. Cross can't get it to go. It's free, Weeks back to Diggins. They'll try it again, this time from outside, no. Levesque tries to keep it alive, out of bounds, off of Johns. It'll stay on this end. I am a little confused. I might be as confused as Brandon Johns after getting hit in the face with the ball. <laughs> On this this is unbelievable, but this is what we talk about as far as offensive rebounding This is why there's such a great offensive rebounding team Because it gives you another chance just keep me in keep me in you know the conversation. That's what an offensive rebound does It's just extends extends the music a little longer Yeah, that shooting percentage for UMass dropped from about 50% to to 30 something percent and part of the reason might be that they've had a couple of those opportunities where they've had three four shots in a row and none of them have fallen that'll hurt the shooting percentage right away diggins no fast the other way none we're gonna get weeks with a block oh he looked like he hit the ground really hard none did number 23 tj weeks take another look mm. team foul number one on umass yeah see his right leg still moving that's a hard fall. I mean, he was completely horizontal there, six or five or six feet up in the air. None was. But yes, this wasn't an issue that we saw with this UMass team is crowd noise. St. Bonnie's, it was an issue. It affected them. It's once again, right there, Diggins rushed that basket. He had plenty of time, several seconds. The crowd starts chatting down. Three, two, one, rushes him. Dominguez earlier was at the three-point line, was unaffected by that. But I think as the game gets on in there, that seven-point deficit, we're seeing UMass get affected by that crowd noise, making bad decisions. It's one of the things you learn early on in your career as Keon Thompson comes back into the game for Diggins. Never trust the away crowd, especially with the shot clock and how much time is left. Especially at the Seagull Center, at the Stew. Especially at the Stew. So that lead up to nine for VCU. A lot on the shoulders of Diggins, a lot on the shoulders of that man, Keon Thompson, the freshman guard without Fernandez, with Luis not playing. Levesque! Textbook. That is a textbook pick and roll. Absolutely textbook. Easy points down low. UMass will need a couple of those trips down the floor. Watkins has it. 13 to shoot to none. Yes, nothing but net. In that scenario, Levesque was backpedaling. DJ Weeks comes in and crashes the paint to help, but he was overextended. None was found wide open. Threes continue to rain down for the Rams. They're now five of seven from long distance in the game. It's a 10 point lead. Weeks 
into the lane. Thompson will take the open three. That one too long. Johns battling for the rebound, but it goes off of his hand and out of bounds. For UMass to win this game, they got to figure out a way to cut into that 10-point lead that VCU has right now. But if they can pull out a victory, it will be number 300 in the collegiate coaching career of that man, Frank Martin. His first year at UMass spent five years at Kansas State, five very successful years. And then 10 years, a decade at South Carolina, taking the program to heights not previously seen, including a Final Four in 2017. Now his first year at UMass, he was drawing some comparisons to his first year at South Carolina, trying to kind of rebuild a program to his first year and, and the task at hand at UMass. And you can kind of see that, he, the way that he's approaching this season in the midst of a conference that deals with a lot of transfers, deals with a lot of roster change and movement, I would say more so than a lot of other places. Wow, what a steal. Right off the bat by Deloche and finished at the rim over Levesque. That is so demoralizing coming out of a timeout. Yeah, Coach Martin didn't seem pleased even before that happened, and he's not going to be pleased with two straight turnovers out of that timeout. When you have an ATO, so, you know, an out-of-bounds play, and that happens, and then immediately you turn the ball over, that is incredibly frustrating. <laughs> incredibly frustrating for a coach. But, yes, back to this idea of building a program, what UMass is trying to accomplish. When you have this much roster turnover, to think long term is, is almost like a little, you have to think, it takes a lot of courage. And I think he's trying to establish that at UMass. He has a team that has incredible bench points. He's rotating players. He's trying to figure out, well, what kind of UMass team do I want to build? And then recruit, you know, moving forward. What's our identity? Well, he's facing a VCU team right now that is built to win now and compete for the A-10 conference title. Brandon Johns, one of those guys brought in from Michigan, a transfer. I mean, Coach Rose just raves about what he does. He goes, he practices like he's trying to make the team every time. Tried to recruit him out of high school. He blew up, was the number one recruit in Michigan. Stelloch down low, denying that shot from Cross. It is a foul. Uh, so there's Johns at Michigan. He's part of those great teams. Deep tournament runs at Michigan. Uh, the assistant coach at VCU, Brent Scott, knew Brandon's dad growing up. Zeb Jackson also kind of worked on Brandon Johns. They were roommates. Get him over to VCU. Wasn't necessarily a package deal. Cross misses there. Watkins with the rebound. But now they're both trying to do something special in their year at VCU. Yeah, that's what Zeb would tell. Zeb Jackson would tell Brandon Johns after because Zeb went first to VCU. Hey, you look like a Ram today. <laughs> While they were living together in Michigan. Eventually, I guess it's just the reassurance and that constant, you know, uh, affirmation by one of his best friends, his roommate, will turn, you know, turn his mind. So here's Zeb. Played at Ann Arbor for two seasons. Never started a game. Only played four games last season. And started five games for VCU. They're both on the court there together. Trying to do something special, and Coach Rhodes saying that Brandon Johns has to embrace that like, he is the guy, he is the man. And it that, is an adjustment. It is an adjustment because you have to understand there is this element. This team, Coach Rhodes told us that people are better being the team is are better teammates than leaders. And clearly, he said, you know, this team, the alpha is Ace Baldwin. He is our guy. He is our leader. But everyone else kind of defers to being a teammate, right? And I think that you have that kind of personality. It is difficult to turn the switch and says, I, you know, I'm going to be the alpha. I'm going to be the assassin now. That's kind of hard when you're more teammate first. 16-point lead. Thompson short. Conte back in the game to Weeks. That one's short. Nothing falling for UMass. Everything difficult. Now they're plummeting to 14% from the floor this half. Watkins, no. So the Minutemen do get a stop quickly the other way. Cross to Conte. Maybe Shriver maybe got away with a little push there. Whatever it was, Conte not able to convert. It's a terrible time for the spigot to be drying up for UMass. 
considering it, that BCU's the second half team. They get the turnover. Conte to Weeks. The lefty three, no, over the backboard. You could really lay a house with the amount of perks that we're seeing. It, this is unfortunate for UMass. They're trying to establish a rhythm. In this scenario, what you would do is you would attack the basket, go to the free throw line. But they're not shooting well from the free throw line either. So you're kind of in a really tough spot, Ahmed. In the, you just kind of have to trust yourself and just keep shooting. Tafari Gapare comes in. The 6'9 freshman. I mean, these are the moments where it's, it's very glaring. Of course, in the first half, you had Dominguez knocking down some of those shots, getting to the free throw line. But now here's where you really miss Noah Fernandez, RJ Luis. Where's that scoring going to come from, from UMass? And will they get enough stops? Another turnover there. So stepping up on the defensive end quickly to TJ Weeks. He stops, lays it up and in. Two in transition for the Minutemen. I understand UMass is down 14. I understand that BCU is a team that likes to play ahead. They like to have a comfortable cushion. I understand they're a second half team. I will say, though, that TJ Weeks in the first half, he was the one who kind of got things going offensively for UMass. He, this might have been another reset for this UMass team offensively. They might make a run now. Watkins hard to the basket. No, but Deloach is there with the tip. 16 points for Jalen Deloach. Conte left wide open, but no. Boy, oh boy, feel like he can't have a whole lot of those for the rest of this game, Corey. No. Uh, one thing you've noticed, the, the pace. VCU, they like to switch up the tempos. Ace ball in the last couple possessions and walking the, the ball up. Seb Jackson getting to the basket. Things starting to look very easy for the Rams. Ace Baldwin steal up to Jackson. Conte defending, but no. And we have a timeout on the court as the lead has ballooned to 20. Two very noble finishes by Zach Jackson right there. I mean, those were tough, tough finishes. And what that means, you know, when you're shooting 67% from the floor as, as a big man, it means you're doing a lot of layups, which is great. Layups, free throws, these are all shots that you want. So giving the Loesch the chance in the absence of, for the vast majority of the first half, Levesque, uh, that chance to kind of just go off, build up a really nice base of confidence, and now we'll see him get a little fancy. I really like what I'm seeing from Jalen Deloach tonight. Scored those career-high 18 points in December versus Navy. Deloach played in 31 games last year, but had just one start. This year he started all 18 games. Not coming off the bench anymore. And, and he it, is a staple, both offensively and defensively, for the Rams, Corey. And this is one of those games where, you know, as this kind of gets out of hand, it's a huge confidence push, boost for the low. Take another quick break. VCU up 20. VCU up 20 midway through the second half in Richmond. Next five games for the Rams. The rivalry with Richmond is coming up on Friday. George Mason. After that, St. Bonaventure at Davidson at St. Louis. You can circle that one as well to kick off the February slate. For VCU, I mean, you figure you have a pretty good chance of winning any game you play in the A-10. Should be near the top, if not at the very top of the conference standings by the time it's all said and done. UMass next five games are at St. Joe's coming up on Saturday. Frank Martin's crew then has Richmond at home, Duquesne at home, then on the road at George Mason. UMass got to figure out something offensively. Also got to get stops on VCU here with 10 and a half to go in the game. No bench points for UMass in this second half. Shriver long. And once again, that, that bench point... It's so critical, but it is a little misleading because they essentially have two starters coming off the bench, right, in Dominguez, mostly, and second, Keon Thompson. Cross going to the basket, draws the foul. Personal foul is charged. That's on Nick Kern. That is his second. Getting an uh, explanation as to the call. 
Noah Fernandes trying to do some coaching from the bench, which is helpful. It'll be more helpful when he can get back out there and provide that scoring that he normally does. Again, if you were not with us at the beginning there, he's missing another game. Kind of a re-aggravation of that ankle injury that we saw at the end of that Harvard game that caused him to miss five games. Coach Frank Martin just saying he's got to get at a place where he feels comfortable with it. Don't think he was all that far away from playing today, but I don't know that the next game is a, a guarantee either. 18-point lead. So you can see a 15-4 run there over the last five and a half. Zeb Jackson getting down low. Deloach denied by Cross. Fantastic Wait, block, but they just threw the ball over again. Turned into another turnover, resulting in a huge basket for BCU. He brought that all the way back. Nick Kearns got some hops. They showed it a couple times in this game. 12 turnovers now for UMass. Starting to pile up. Cross. Nope. Offensive foul. Kern able to draw it that time. Maybe the explanation that he got from the official helped. So that's just Zeb Jackson. And what's so fascinating about Zeb Jackson, he was celebrating Kern's success ahead of time. He saw the opportunity, called for the ball back. Kern then makes that great cut and then finishes with this tomahawk. Incredible two-handed dunk. And on the other end, he gives you the ball back by forcing a turnover with that charge. That's the kind of BCU team, and, and they're up by 20 points. You saw this also throughout the season against Davidson, where they're up by 10, 20 points in the second half with a few minutes left, and they're still shooting threes. They're still playing to the very last second. As a coach, you love that. None, no. For Kern, he's now at a career-high 10. At 9, at Dayton. That shot by Weeks is off the mark. And Kern with it. The other way to Shriver for three. Yes. Everything working for VCU, Corey. Kern had both hands up. He turned down a layup to give Shriver that three pointer. Cross maybe quiets the crowd just a bit. The lead, though, 21. You know it's going well, Corey, when the celebration's happening mid shot. And we've seen that a couple times now for the Rams including the foam fingers here at the stew. Three of them. Three foam fingers. Uh, yeah, I, I think right now what VCU is kind of doing, in addition to playing to the last second, is confidence boosters for everyone around. Jaden Nunn. Everything looks incredibly easy offensively and defensively right now for Mike Rhodes' side. They're shooting over 57% from the floor right now this half. Wildens Levesque denied by Deloach, but they're going to get him on a foul. Ball. Back in Richmond, when you've been as good as VCU has been over the past few years, you're going to produce some guys who will play in the league, and that's exactly what they did with Vince Williams, starred for VCU from 2018 to 2022, then was the 47th overall pick in last year's draft by the Memphis Grizzlies, has spent some time with the Grizzlies, also has played quite a bit with the G League team there in Memphis. The Memphis Hustle scored 18.8 .8 points per game for them and still wants to check out his, his friends, his former teammates, was able to do that. Went to that epic finish in Dayton over the Flyers. The VCU Rams getting the win. So he is still involved in this program and is having the time of his life when you talk to Mike Rhodes about his time in the NBA and G League. Yeah, Coach Rose was telling us that he, he, when he had a moment with Vince, just Vince lit up and said, Coach, every single day I, I wake up and I'm a basketball player. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great feeling when you grow up wanting to play this game and then you realize, hey, pinch yourself. You did it. You actually are a basketball player. You get paid to play this game. He's also very, Coach Rhodes, is very uh, connected with all his former players. That's a big VCU staple. 22 points is the lead. Shriver Johns. Two more easy points for the Rams. At this point, Frank Martin and crew for UMass looking for maybe some moral victories in the last 
Seven minutes and change. Cross, deep three, off the mark. Nothing falling for UMass. The shooting has gone ice cold. Now two of their last 11 from the floor. A whistle, a foul. They're going to get Wilden's Levesque. Personal foul charge to number zero. Wilden's Levesque. When you're, when you're in this scenario and you're VCU, and it must feel like you have like a superpower that you know that in the second half we can turn it on. It reminds me, um, and I know you love history and you love fun facts, reminds me of that old, uh, that old rowing team for the U.S., the Washington boys uh, from 1936, that, those Olympic games. Okay. They always were a second half of the race team. Okay. And all the other teams that they competed on these regattas, they kept looking over their shoulder the entire time. Okay, we got a boat length on them. We got two boats laid on them, but we know they're coming. We know they're coming, and it would just eat at them. And then, you know, the, the coxswain would turn it on. These boys would just fly, and they'd end up winning the race every time. That's kind of what VCU reminds me of. Like, they have this extra gear that if you're a team like UMass, hey, we're keeping it tight. The largest lead is four points in the first half, but you know they're coming. It eats away at you. I would not have guessed that we would have gotten a rowing boys reference into the boys of the boat today. It's a great book. Although, if you told me the score was 73-47, maybe I would have said yes. I, that is a possibility. That one out of bounds, deflected. Looks like none got a hand on that. We'll stay at this end for UMass. The good news for Frank Martin and crew is this is not about one game. It's not even about one year. It's about building a program, which he hopes to do over the next several years here. Kind of imprint his identity. The problem is giving up 73 points with seven to go is not the identity that he wants to bring to the Minutemen. I think this is indicative of just, well, how good are we as a litmus test? It's the best team in the conference. We can play the first half. Second half, we just fell apart. What happened? That's one of those post-mortems that you do as a coaching staff and as a team. It's a real gut check. You have to understand, look, we're not there yet. We have a lot to go. Shriver long on that. His shooting percentage now for David Shriver is plummeting from three-point land. It was about 80% over the last four games. He's two for four. He's only 50% in this game here today. Yeah, he, he hasn't necessarily been that active. Haven't needed him. Haven't needed him. And, I, and neither has Ace Baldwin. You look at his stat line. He doesn't jump out from a points perspective. I think he only has two points. But it's, it's fascinating because this game plan was, Coach Rose told us, be physical, out-rebound, limit turnovers. And they've done that. Jalen Deloge and Brandon Johns Jr. have filled that space for them. So game plan executed. Five players in double figures for VCU. Zeb Jackson with 10. None with 13. Brandon Johns has 10. Nick Kern has 10. And Deloach with a game-high 16. And this is what I meant by building confidence. You see the way... Beautiful pass by Watkins, no? Jackson with two more. Every team has those games where you need to, you need to kind of draw back on. It's kind of like having a mine and just mining ore, right? Like, you need to know that, hey, back in December, I had a career-high 18 points against Navy, right? And then now, against UMass, in conference play, I put up 18 points. Like, I know I can do this. And that's what everyone's getting. Everyone on the whole team of VCU is getting that, hey, I know I can put up 10 points in conference play. I did it against UMass. It's time to do it again in the tournament or wherever else. Yeah, and that man, Ace Baldwin, can get some rest in a game like this. Doesn't have to play 39 minutes like he did in that game against the Dayton Flyers in Dayton. Jackson was called for that foul. Cross back at the line. For UMass, offensively, 23 threes. Mike Rhodes' defense for the Rams has something to do with that percentage. They're shooting just 17%, have made just four of those 23 threes. Have struggled at the line as well. Missed free throw there. 12 of 18 from the line. So outside of an early good offensive start for UMass, it's been a struggle. Cross tied up by Shriver. Puts it back up. Cross. 
You said that VCU just a couple minutes ago, you just casually drop. You go best team in the league. You think they're the best team in the A-10? Statistically, factually, they are at the current moment. Well, there are three teams at four and one. True, but they beat Dayton. <laughs> they so beat you're like, okay, there are two teams left in that conversation. And you know this is a team that improves week to week. It also reminds me, I don't want to belabor the point. I mean, they're up 23 points, so I guess I can go into the story. But I remember I was talking to one of my friends who's a track and field athlete, and I was asking him, well, look, how do you ap approach training in the season when you want to peak at the right times? Certain times in the season, you're working on form. Other times, you're working on fitness. But you want to make sure you peak at the right time. And that's what this VCU team kind of reminds me of, like a track and field athlete, where sometimes they don't have the best outing. Sometimes, you know, yes, they need to work on certain things, but they're peaking at the right time. Well, Mike Rhodes wants to talk about something in this game. He calls timeout. We'll take the timeout break with him. VCU's got 75 points in this game. Their leading scorer, that man right there, Ace Baldwin, has two. But you see the impact that he makes when he is out on the court, either as a scorer or a facilitator. With him, 71 points per game last two seasons. Without him, they're under 60. That 12-point differential is for a few reasons. You think about a facilitator, one, getting other people involved, getting them in rhythm. That's the job of a point guard, right? It's, it's, it's like you want to make sure that they are in a position to succeed. The other piece as far as he only has two points, three assists this game. And yet, they're up above their you know, average of the 75. The, re the reason that is the case is because he draws attention. This is something that is not exhibited on a stat sheet. When you know this guy is going to give you, you know, he's the leading scorer. He leads in assists. There is this gravitational pull defensively. He's the focus of game plans. So that means that, you know, there's always an open guy somewhere because there's going to be two or more resources dedicated to Ace Baldwin. Well, if this game's any indication, there's going to be more gravitational pulls to some of these other players who've shown that they can, they can score, put up double digits. Josh Banks into the game, takes that shot just at the shot clock buzzer. Going to get Matt Cross on the walk, so the turnover by UMass. Those turnovers starting to rack up for them. They've got now 14 in the game, and this is also something VCU does, and we saw it against Dayton. Now, UMass a little deeper than a team like Dayton, plays more players, but teams get worn down at the end of games, certainly when you're down by 20-plus. Seeing more sloppy play, the shot's not falling, everything becoming harder for UMass in the final minutes here in Richmond. The way that VCU plays, this is why Coach Rhodes is so frustrated. Well, I don't know exactly why. I'm not Coach Rhodes. But one of the reasons that in my mind that Coach Rhodes is so frustrated at these slow starts is because VCU plays best when they are ahead. Because when they have that cushion, the way Havoc works with mixing up the different pressure looks. As, a, as a, an opponent, you're trying to get back. And then desperation seeps in. And when desperation seeps in, bad decision-making seeps in. And in basketball, a lots of bad decision making you know, generally leads to losing. Frank Martin still got high energy. Wildens Levesque no longer can play in this game. Fifth foul for him. He had those two early. Didn't play a whole lot, just five minutes in the first half. Ends the game with 14 minutes, just four points. So he comes out of the game. Isaac Conte is in along with Gianni Thompson comes into the game, the sophomore forward. It's not as simple as it just all riding on the shoulders of Noah Fernandez, because as we mentioned before, UMass able to win their last game against Rhode Island without him. But, Corey, you made a good point at the top of the broadcast. It's how many games in a row can you do it without him? Hopefully, you don't, you don't have to ask that question or answer that question, because... You, know, you don't want to be in that scenario for very long. So it is unfortunate that they are enduring this beating against you know one of the top teams in the conference without Noah Fernandes. But it does have an asterisk to it because you know he's, you know you're, you're going to see them again with him, you know, hopefully. So I guess there is a if you're looking for a moral of the story, you're a UMass. At least you could talk about that at the bar with your friends. Hey, at least we didn't have Noah. Conte sloppy with it, able to get it back. Can't finish near the rim, though. VCU a chance to add to their lead and add another name to the point total in the box score. Josh Banks from the corner. Another three. If you're playing in a white jersey, 
We've got some good range today. Jackson quickly up ahead. Watkins. But this is the point that impresses me about this VCU team. As Diggins finishes at the rim. The thing that impresses me about the VCU team is the fact that they're still running the floor. Like hard. Watkins was running the floor hard there. They're up 25 points. That type of dedication and devotion this late in the game when you know you have it sealed is is pretty impressive and I think it goes back to this idea of this team improves game to game coach Rhodes told us that physicality was something that they lacked in rebounding something that they lacked in you've seen them improve in that area today that was the test they passed the test so I, I feel like they're kind of passing tests and accumulating layers uh, of just you know with that toughness as they approach the tournament, which is very exciting. Watkins in and out. Deloach, physical down low. Two more for Deloach. And he's got 19, a new career high for the sophomore forward. What a game for Jalen Deloach. 19 points, 12 rebounds, strong physical down low. See this moment? Coach Rhodes talking to Jalen Deloach. I think Coach Rhodes, just in our conversations, he, he's impressed me in his ability to speak to players. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, he was telling us about his, his relationship with Brandon Johns Jr. and how he says, this guy just fires me up. I love talking to him before games. And I said, well, what do you talk about? You know, like, it's, it's an interesting question. What do you talk to the head coach about before you play a game? R&B. Boys to men. Easy by the Commodores. 80s and 90s <laughs> hip hop. But like that idea, like That's this guy important. can relate, you know, to his players at a deep level and also feed off of it. Not just like, a, hey, I'm going to encourage you, but you encourage me. I think that moment to Loach. Wow. Highlight reel continues for the Rams. Add another one for Nick Kern. Nick Kern has had some incredible plays. High energy acrobatics. 12 points for Kern. Also a career high. He's going to be an important rotational player for this BCU team. He already is. Watkins, no. You might not have another game, at least here recently, or in the near future for VCU, where everything clicks so well, offensively, defensively. He was back and forth for the first 10 minutes of this game. 15 minutes ever since then. The final 25 has been a rout. And this is different from the Dave last outing against uh, Dayton because there was this moment where they looked vulnerable and weak and disjointed, which was uncharacteristic of a Mike Rhodes VCU team before 25 minutes. Now, today, we have seen them dominating for 25 minutes. So empty the bench here if you are VCU. This is... Arnold Henderson checking all the box scores. The the senior guard. On. It's a great moment when you're, it's just as a player, a former player myself, when you see the preferred walk ons get a chance to play, knowing how hard they work, it is so exciting and thrilling to see you know, your, your teammate have that moment. He should put up a three. Everything's going in. I don't think they're going to take a shot, though. VCU. Second half. All Rams, all Mike Rhodes. That is a clinic. Corey, what do you take away from that victory? VCU, once again, true to form. Second half team, they get better as the game goes on. They get better as the season goes on. It's interesting, without Noah Fernandes, UMass stalled out in the second half. They looked good for the first half. Without Ace Baldwin's point total, BCU was fine. <laughs> so that's a great sign for BCU and a concerning sign for UMass. So to the second, the updated standings in the conference. Dayton also in action today. So we've got two 5-1 teams now. 
Dayton about to win, so we have counted that. St. Louis at four and one, three one loss teams. To your point, VCU, you can make the argument right now as we sit here. I know that Corey Robinson's favorite to win the A-10, probably a lot of people's favorite to win, especially after the performance we saw here today. 19 for Deloach, a game high in a game that saw the Rams shoot 53% from the floor.